All right, with that being said, for the rest of you, you probably saying, I don't have a demon. Well, you, we're gonna find out whether you have one or not. And you're gonna pray this prayer. Oh, don't back out now. No, 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 don't turn off the, don't turn off the computer and don't turn off the smart television talking about, oh, I'm gonna log off now. Do not log off now. If you log off now, that's a demon because you were just fine enjoying the conversation and now you wanna log off, that's the devil. Satan, I bind you right now in the name of Jesus, Messiah of Israel to stop them from logging off, turning off the TV or just walking away. I bind you now. You're going to leave them to pray this prayer and then not logging off in the name of Jesus. Okay. So for those of you that are right now, well, I don't have a demon. We're going to find out. You're going to pray this prayer. And if you don't have one, you have nothing to lose. But if you refuse to pray it, then you have with your, I don't have a demon, have identified that you do have a demon because all it is is a prayer. And I know you believe in prayer. What's wrong with praying? The fact that you don't want to pray it should indicate that you might need some deliverance. And it's not going to be a long drag, those of you that are watching it. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm watching this broadcast and I think or I know or I don't know that I might need deliverance but you know my heart and you know whether I need deliverance or not so Holy Spirit I give you authority go into every area in my life where the door is closed and says do not enter open those doors and turn on the light and find every demon in me or reveal any curse that's activated holy spirit i'm asking you now set me free lord jesus you are my deliverer now in the name of jesus now in the name of jesus now come, go, leave this body in Jesus' name. Don't worry, son. We're going to find every devil hiding in this body. We're going to find every devil. Oh, yeah. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. Where are you coming? Where are you going? Go now in Jesus' mighty name. Loose him now. Thank you, Father. Now grab him again. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hi, Terrence. Everybody repeat after me, Satan, get out of his body in Jesus' name! Go! Go! Oh, you're a work in progress, Terrence. You're a work in progress. Lower it. I command every spirit that came in this body as a result of opening doors through sexual perversion, fornication, orgies, lustful encounters with men and women, all of you, go, 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 out, out, all of you, all of you in the name of Jesus, come out of his legs, come out of his feet, come out of his torso, come out of his hands, come out of his head, come out of his shoulder, leave this body in Jesus' mighty name. Uh, turn it up. You're going to be a work in progress. But we don't leave houses empty. As you raise your hands, the Holy Spirit's going to fill every empty area. There it goes. There it goes. Five, four, three, two, one. Take it. There it goes. Holy Spirit, fill. Fill now. In the name of Jesus. Fill now in the name of Jesus. Fill now. And here is where the demons dwell. The demons ain't dwelling. They're not dwelling in your polished church self because you have order in that room. Hmm. They're dwelling in the other room that you hate going into or they dwell in the do not enter room. I'm speaking figuratively here yeah, so that yeah. your viewers can understand. And that's where God showed me deliverance from the demons hiding in the 90 rooms. And I think that's where most Christians are struggling because we're so busy guarding the door.
But the Bible says the thief don't, doesn't come through the door. He climbs up some other way, John chapter 10. And I'll leave it there. And we could go further into that. So the question right. is, Apostle, how do I clean out these rooms? And there's there's so much I want to talk to you about because you go into each room having a purpose. Each room has right. its own furniture. In fact, I want to I want to I want to go here. I don't care how much time we got. Come on, let's I want to go here. here. You talk about how <laughs> your bedroom, for example, has a right. purpose. It has a bed. Ooh. Even if you right. evict a demon, if he removes the bed in the eviction. You'll mm -hmm. be frustrated in that room. Just talk. Tell us a little okay. bit about that. The gentleman you heard speaking throughout this today consistently is Alexander Pagani. He identifies himself as an apostle. And we're going to talk a little bit about that during this topic today. But I wanted to look at a book that he wrote in 2018 titled The Secrets to Deliverance. We're going to listen to some clips from some interviews he did. And I'm going to take you through the book because I read it. And we're going to see some of the things that it says, and we're going to look at some of the scriptures that he identified, and we're going to test this against the authority, which is scripture, and to see if it matches up and to see if scripture is sufficient, or my argument would be that this book is um, going to come from a place of making it seem as if scripture is insufficient, even though Pagani does not make that claim in this book. I want to be fair in saying that. He does not make the claim that scripture is insufficient. I am going to say, though, that making such claims that you have divine revelation, and this would be considered divine revelation, and helping a believer to know how to conduct themselves is essentially making scripture insufficient in providing instruction, correction, and the things that we need in training us up in righteousness. So, I hope that you will join me with an open Bible, and I hope that you will consider the things that are shared here today in light of what Scripture has to say or is silent on, should we say, in the matter of deliverance, the multiple rooms in a person, and demons hiding in body parts. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Six Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Six Scribe. I hold in my hands a copy of the book written by Alexander Pagani called The Secrets to Deliverance, Defeat the Toughest Cases of Demonic Bondage. And I have read this book personally myself, and I wanted to read the bio to you because I want to talk about, first and foremost, uh, the claim as an apostle and to refer to a clip uh, from a friend of Pagani's uh, talking about apostleship and to set the framework for that. And then from there, we are going to look at some of the things in this book. In addition, listen to a couple of clips from some interviews that he did surrounding the teachings in this book. Now, the bio on the back for Alexander Pagani says this. He is the founder of He Is Risen Tabernacle in Bronx, New York. He is an apostolic Bible teacher with keen insight into the realm of the demonic, generational curses, and deliverance. An internationally sought-after conference speaker, he takes an uncompromising approach to the scriptures and has been involved in more than 400 deliverance sessions. He has appeared on various television networks, including TBN and the Word Network, an honorary graduate of Central Pentecostal Bible Institute. He carries a spirit of wisdom and discernment to unlock secrets of the kingdom with signs and wonders following his ministry. Now, I don't know if you caught that, that last sentence, but... That caught my attention when I read this, not only near the beginning where he says he is an apostolic Bible teacher, but also, too, that he carries a spirit of wisdom and discernment to unlock secrets of the kingdom with signs and wonders following his ministry. Now, I may be jumping the gun here, but I seem to recall that in Scripture, the apostles of Christ uh, were known because signs and wonders followed their ministry, and they also wrote Scripture in other words, they were able to bring revelation. And Pagani claims that he's bringing this revelation, this extra biblical revelation in this book, The Secrets to Deliverance. Now, the reason why I bring this up at the forefront is because this kind of harkens back to some of the teachings I've talked about before of apostles with governing authority, that they have more authority 
than a pastor does. They are able to decree and declare things. They are able to bring extra biblical revelation. And they will cite this by saying an angel came to them or Jesus walked in the room. I mean, there's other ways or the, that the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And you're going to hear that type of language today as we look at this book. And we also listen to some interview clips, both from a year ago and from four years ago, where there's also some discrepancies in how he received this extra biblical revelation. But not to jump the gun ahead of that, I want to stick with the apostolic claim here. I recalled a statement made by Isaiah Saldivar recently when he was reviewing American Gospel. And if you saw the review that I did of his review, then I did play that clip. I played that in the, in the entirety of the review of American Gospel that he did. And he paused at one point in his review and he said, By the way, let me just make something clear because I'm definitely a big voice in the charismatic world and Pentecostal world. I do not know one person, this is for everyone in the chat, listen closely, and the creator of this documentary, I do not know one person of all the apostles I know that claims to be like a modern, like a biblical apostle. It's a completely different context. No one I know is trying to write scripture, write canon, or believes there's some special superpower apostle or prophet. I share this statement that Isaiah stated because it brought me to that when I read this bio. It reminded me of a person who believes that they are an apostle with governing authority, who believes that they, they have the ability to decree and declare things, that they have a power over territorial spirits that they claim are in certain geographical locations, who decree and declare blessings over revivals, as Pagani did. And what I find in this book, too, is that there is these claims, including in his bio, that seem to allude to that. And apostles in Scripture they were known, the apostles of Christ were known because of the things, because they had that authority in the church, and they also had signs and wonders that followed them. And so I just find that interesting that that's even mentioned in his bio. And I, I don't know if that's because that is to, uh, to validate the call to apostleship. I don't know. But again, that is the identifying characteristics of an apostle of Christ the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles that were chosen by Christ himself, and also to include Paul, depending on what your thought is on Paul being one of the actual apostles of Christ or not. There's even some debate about that within the church. That's not a salvific issue, but that is something that's on the table for people to discuss that they either agree or disagree as far as that's concerned. At any rate, I just found that interesting. And the reason why I also find it interesting is because of the claims as to how he received this revelation. And I also would uh, lump that in, include that in with the call of claiming to be an apostle. If the contents of this book that I hold in my hand, The Secrets to Deliverance, are in fact revelation, then the argument could be made that this needs to be attached to the back of the Bible. That may sound lofty to those who are listening, but I want you to hear these clips as to what his claims are, and then we'll also see it in the book as we go through it, of how he received this, quote, revelation. And what we'll find interesting when listening to this is the discrepancies in the claims, both in the uh, interview given four years ago and the claim a year ago and the claim in the book. It's muddy. For lack of a better word, it's muddy. And there's discrepancies in it. So let's have a listen to the first clip from a year ago, and then we'll listen to the one from four years ago, and then we'll go back to the book. You talk about in the book, uh, you had a dream where a well-known leader came to you and handed you a book. And I think this is a good place to start before we dig into the revelation of the book. Well, um, back in 2000, in the end of 2015, the Holy Spirit, because I'm a Spirit-filled believer, I pray in tongues extensively. Um, I heard the Holy Spirit tell me, entering into the year 2016, I want you to pray this whole year in tongues, no English for the rest of this year. Now, that's a pretty heavy statement coming from the Holy Spirit, because um, why would he tell me to just pray in tongues and no English? Um, I didn't know. But in obedience, I began to pray for the whole year, the whole year of 2016. I would get up at 4.30 a.m. to 5 a.m. I would spend my hour with the Lord just praying in tongues, just edifying myself, you know, pressing in. Midway uh, towards, the, towards the end of the year, <clears throat> I have this vision or this, this dream and a well-known 
uh, personality came to me, uh, more of an angelic personality and told me, open your hand. So when I open my hand like this, uh, in this, in this vision, he places, <clears throat> he places a book in my hand about the size of a credit card. And when I look at this book, it's glistening in sky blue, but the words are like glowing in the brightest of gold. I can't explain it, but it was like clear gold. And it said the secrets to deliverance. The being closed my hand and disappeared. After that, I came out of this vision. And from that day up until today, there's always a revelation or some kind of deeper insight into this revelation of deliverance waiting for me almost every morning. I can't explain it, but every morning there's a revelation waiting for me. Now, Pagani is going to go on to tell Alan Didio, who's doing this interview on his YouTube channel, that he was given confirmation by Charisma because they wanted to change the title of the book to Secrets to Deliverance. He had it named something else, and uh, they were giving him the ability to write the book. They'd reached out to him, and when he submitted the title, they said they liked it, but it was not what they wanted to name it, and they wanted to name it The Secrets to Deliverance, and he claims that this was the confirmation he received that this was from God. Now, I don't know how you don't receive confirmation that an angelic being slash a well-known minister comes to you in a vision and gives you this. And that whole thing right there in that interview is fuzzy, to say the least, because he never makes that distinction. However, in this interview four years ago about the very same topic, he had this to say about how he got the revelation. Have a listen. So let's talk at this point about the, the divine revelation. How did that play out? Um, I jumped into deliverance uh, not knowing what I was doing, um, and then I teamed up with another minister, and we did we did some deliverance, and I started to get uh, some understanding. And it wasn't until um, I got on this man, I, I had like this intense pursuit of God's presence because I wanted answers. I read this one verse that revolutionized me, Mark Matthew chapter thirteen. He said, "Unto you, it is given." to know the secrets of the kingdom, but to them it is not. And then he goes on to say, to him who has more will be given, and to him who has not, the little bit that he has will be taken with him. And I understood that to mean that if I wanted to know, then I needed to actively pursue and abandon everything to get that answer. And I, that's what I did. I went on a literally like a 90 day fast and I'm not exaggerating. I did 40 days and then I, I stopped and then I did another 13 days. I just pursued. And all I said was, God, I want to know the secrets to deliverance. I want to know the secrets to deliverance. I said, because some of these books that I'm reading now does not cater to the inner city black and Latino culture. This is catering to a different demographic of people. I need current, uh, fresh uh, strategies, fresh uh, anointing, fresh oil for evolved demons that plague uh, the New York City, inner city, hip-hop demographic. God, you got to give us answers because this stuff here and these books are not catering to this group because these demons that we're dealing with in the inner city, at least for black and Latino, um, they can handle uh, prayers from these books. I need new strategies. And I just pursued about 18 months of just me and the Holy Spirit. And then one day, mm -hmm. one day, without looking, about, without looking for it, you know, um, I have a vision. And in the vision, this nine-foot angel, well, at least in the dream, it didn't appear to be an angel, but he, he, was, he was huge. He comes up to me, just randomly, just walks straight to me and says, open your hand. Mm -hmm. And when I op open both your hands, when I open both my hands, he places a book in it. The book, the book is small, but it's glistening in sky blue. And the words on the cover of the book says, The Secrets to Deliverance, and it was glistening in gold. He closes my hand, and it disappears, like vanishes. I wake up out of whatever I was in. And from that day until this day, there's an open heaven and there's an angel assigned to me in the area of deliverance. Um, and that's how it started. Uh, there is a divine mandate, at least on my life, to help 
people get set free in the area of demonic uh, torment. Now, I want to read from Pagani's book, and we're going to look at it further. I highlighted some things in here, but I wanted to start on page two in the introduction, and he opens up his book, The Secrets to Deliverance, with sharing a personal testimony. He shares a lot of personal testimonies in here, personal experiences, anecdotal experiences of when he had um, manifested a demon after he was saved in a business meeting. And he describes that in detail. And this is how he affirms his belief in Christians having indwelling demons. Bottom of page two in this book, I wanted to read this to you. He says, I realize that if a demon could live in a body part, which this is a premise of this book, he is going to teach that not only do Christians have rooms, as we heard a clip earlier of the 90 rooms, and you may be going, what in the world? Where did he get that? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that in the book. But he also talks about that there are demons that live in body parts. And this is the revelation along with the rooms is what he got because his claim is the teaching, the deliverance teaching from the 70s is outdated and that there need to be new strategies. As you heard, he was frustrated. He wanted a way to be able to minister to a certain demographic and that the evolved demons is what he called them. And so he was seeking after new information. This was just what he had was not sufficient. I'm not sure why he didn't go to scripture. Uh, just, just to see in general what scripture had to say on it, because scripture is sufficient in helping us understand deliverance. And I think it's important also, too, that as believers, we understand deli that salvation is deliverance and that we are delivered from the penalty of sin. We are delivered from the power of sin and we will be delivered from the presence of sin when we're in heaven and glorified with Christ after we've breathed our last breath on this earth. But at any rate, he talks about that if he realized that um, demons could live in body parts, then that he needed to look further into where else an unclean spirit might hide so that as a deliverance minister, he could be more targeted and specific in his prayers. And so he sought God on this. And he said within a couple of months, he had a dream. Now, please recall in the clips I just played, sometimes he says dream. Sometimes he says a dream or a vision. He doesn't know which one it was. And he says, in it, I was approached by a well-known ministry leader, this is in the book, who told me to open my hand. When I did, this person gave me a little book with the title, The Secrets to Deliverance, Shining in Gold Letters. The minister then closed my hands and I woke up. He says, quote, from that day until now, my spirit has been receiving download after download of insight into the realm of the human soul and the demonic. And shortly after that dream, God began showing him why it took so long for some people to get free, including himself, that God revealed the human soul can be shattered in pieces. And, and he references Psalm chapter seven, verse two, where it says, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces while there is none to deliver. He says demons hide in these fragmented pieces in the human soul until someone cleans up the mess and picks up the pieces. So I simply wanted to point out the discrepancy in how he received this revelation and also to remind you that this is a claim of new revelation this is authoritative this is not something if you're claiming that god gave you this through an angelic being or through a minister and you're saying these are the secrets the holy spirit told me this the holy spirit helped me to see that the words in scripture have dual uh, different meanings than what than what some other people would say that they have and that there's hidden meanings or secret knowledge to be found that's gnosticism and so that is something that we need to be aware of we need to um, address it it's gnosticism if we're trying to find secrets in scripture and give it new fresh meaning because we just need something new and fresh and we want to find all the hidden knowledge in there that maybe no one else could find that's gnosticism that's a heresy that that the church dealt with early on in its infancy in the first century so that's one of the things that the church had to fight against was gnosticism and so I wanted to address this fact of this Gnostic teaching and wanting to utilize scripture in such a way that we're trying to find this hidden revelation. And also the fact, too, that apostles claim extra biblical revelation and governing apostles do that as well. So it's definitely something worth considering and bringing up because that's that is the foundation of this book is relying and going back to 
a revelation that was given to you through a dream or vision. He doesn't know which one. And so we don't know which one. And we don't know if it's an angelic being or we it's a well-known minister because it's not clear because he hasn't been clear in making that distinction. And I don't know why. I do know that it's concerning when someone claims that an angel came to them and gave them extra biblical revelation. And we've seen that um, concerningly enough in other areas that we can easily pinpoint with other leaders such as Joseph Smith and others who have made claims such as these. Um, even Brian Simmons for the Passion Translation has made such claims. Um, that Jesus came into his room and breathed on him, that that an angel, and that was, again, something else that was a bit alarming in that four-year-old interview that Pagani did. He says an angel is assigned to his ministry for deliverance. Brian Simmons also makes the claim that an angel is assigned to his ministry. In fact, he named the Passion Translation after an angel. So I'm throwing that out so you can be aware of these things and to test them for yourself against Scripture. Scripture is the standard. And Scripture in context, by the way, is the standard. Just because someone puts Scripture in their books does not mean that they're using it in the proper context. Let's just point that out as well. Now, I want to stick in this book for a little bit, and I'm going to pull up some clips from these interviews as we go. But I have some points highlighted in this book that we're going to go through so that you can have an idea of what this book is about, The Secrets to Deliverance. What secrets do we need to have revealed to us that God f apparently did not put in the Word of God, in the canon of Scripture, that we need to know about deliverance that's secret? Well, on page four, um, Pagani says, The demons that lodge themselves in the rooms of our souls and in our body parts don't respond to cookie-cutter deliverance formulas. And he goes on to say, Deliverance is less like a maze and more like a labyrinth. As we move past the introduction, the first chapter we come to is called The Mystery of Prototype Timing. And he references John 2, 21 in here when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. When he's addressing the Pharisees and he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. He says that God gave him the revelation of the different meanings of words. And so that every time Jesus used the word temple, that he meant his body every single time. And so that equates to us as well. And he's going to uh, borrow from the Old Testament in order to have this better understanding of how demons can enter our bodies. He's going to use the construction of the temple in Solomon's time in order for us to understand that we can have these 90 rooms in our being that the Holy Spirit has to go in and search out and turn on the lights is what he likes to call it and to drive out the demons to cast them out. He he professes to um, telling people to pray to give the Holy Spirit permission let me just say this right now, and at that clip that I played at the very beginning, when there's um, some manipulation going on there of saying, if you don't want to pray this prayer, then you have a demon. I am not going to pray a prayer that gives God permission. That in itself is faulty, and that is a God of my own design. I can't give God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, I cannot give God permission to do anything. I am a created being and he is God. So for me to pray a prayer and to say, oh, Holy Spirit, I give you permission. I have no understanding when I pray that prayer. And I, and I used to pray that way, guys. And again, when I say pray, that's in quotation marks because that's not real prayer to God. That is prayer to someone I have created in my own understanding and in my own imagination. I used to pray, oh, I give you, whole, I give you uh, permission, Holy Spirit. So I'm not going to pray that way because that's not prayer. That's making me God. And that's diminishing the power of God, the omnipotence of God, the sovereignty of God. I don't give God permission. So I am not going to claim to pray such a thing. That's error. Uh, and I'm sure the, the the claim could be made, well, you have a demon then. Well, then you choose to believe that. I am spirit-filled. I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I don't fear demons coming into me. I have absolutely no fear of demons lodging in the supposed 90 rooms that are within my being that Scripture does not specifically say that I contain. That talks about the Temple of Solomon, and that was in the Old Covenant. And the temple in the New Covenant points to far greater, including at the end of time and to what lies ahead in New Jerusalem. So I, I am not fearful of demons indwelling me. I know that the battle with demonic 
and I do acknowledge the demonic, I know that the battle with the demonic is from without, not within. And the answer to my battle is what the word of God says, to know that it is written and to understand that scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit and it has been given by God for our instruction and to help us in our time of need, our time of difficulty, our time of temptation, our times of trial and hardship, our times in a fallen world. So no, I am not going to pray something like that. And whatever claims are made, let them be made. <laughs> it, it, it does not make a difference to me because I know what scripture says is the final authority. At any rate, that those claims were made at the beginning, if you remember those, and that um, that you needed to be willing to do those things and to say, maybe you have a demon, maybe you, you don't have one, you're not sure. It, it's, it again, it is so vague. The, the verbiage is so vague and so blanketed that it's very confusing and it just leads to bondage because people, as, as I go on in this book, it, it was very sad to read through it because I thought no one is going to have freedom from this. I mean, you're always going to be thinking, well, you know, I've got some demon lodging in my skin. I've got some demon lodging in my nose. And that may sound funny to you, but that's in this book. So anyway, we'll keep moving on. Chapter two talks about the blueprint of the temple. And so he's going to uh, be looking at Ezekiel 42 in here. He does mention at the beginning about Mark five and the account with the uh, demoniac with the legion of demons. And he poses the question to God, where does legion go when entering a person? And he spent, he said he spent hours looking into this and really couldn't figure it out until one day he was watching a movie called I, Robot, and he began to understand better because the Holy Spirit uh, whispered to him that he had been asking the wrong questions and he needed to adjust his questions to get the right answer based on this movie. So he said he needed to study the Temple of Solomon was his conclusion. And as he studied the Temple of Solomon, he came to these conclusions in this chapter. In the, under the subheading of can demons live in the temple, he says, quote, I do believe you can be owned by God, but still have areas in your life that have demonic habitation, not possession, but cohabitation. While demons are prohibited from dwelling inside a believer by the courtroom of heaven, and I do want to do a topic about the courtroom of heaven because this is not a biblical teaching, by the way. Robert Henderson came up with this. He has many books about it. I do not agree with this teaching because of the, the inconsistencies with it with scripture, and it's very concerning in some of the things that it promotes in its teaching. Uh, he says they can legally gain access based on this if they are given permission to enter. For those who may be unfamiliar with this idea and are worried about straying from sound doctrine, let's briefly consider some passages from scripture that show how this is possible. And he goes on in this chapter in the blueprint of the temple to talk about birds in the heart, um, referencing Matthew 13, 3 through 4 and verses 19 about the parable of the sower. And then he talks about birds and the trees, which he alludes to both. He he says both of these point to demons, that demons actually enter the heart and that they are able to snatch the word away. I would just encourage you to do some studies on this. The birds and the trees, he references Matthew 13, 31 through 32. And he says it has an additional meaning other than what is normally believed about that, about the birds nesting in the trees from the seed that brings forth a huge tree. He also believes that demons um, represent those birds as well and that they can lodge in the tree or the person. As he goes on, he talks about the narrow recessed windows that Solomon put in the temple in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 4, and that this created more potential entry points for demons that had to be guarded. I have a quick question. Does the scripture ever say in the Old Testament that demons inhabited the temple of God? I want you to think about that. Talks about an Ezekiel where later on, as we'll see, that Ezekiel was shown by God a hole in the wall and he began to dig through it. And he provides extra biblical revelation on what that means as well for that whole. But uh, Ezekiel ends up finding that there were idolatrous practices being um, conducted in this area. But God knew about them. They were not hidden from God, but that they were going on. They were going on and God was drawing Ezekiel to that, to, to have better understanding of that and to let him know that it, it was, it was known by God because the people thought it was not known by God, but God knew he knew what was going on, but it never says in there that there were demons in the temple. 
and I want to talk a little bit about that too as we go on because there's something else that's missing from this teaching, this understanding, this extra biblical revelation being presented that demons just easily enter the temple. Like we're going to use Solomon's a temple blueprint which came from David and Solomon built it and we're going to use this as a template as extra biblical revelation claiming that the Holy Spirit showed him this in order to say well now today in a better covenant that demons can enter and indwell born again believers now there is something here I do want to agree with with Pagani on page 29 he says you renew your mind by reading and meditating on God's word each day yes and amen and that's what we all should be doing as believers. We need to be in the word and meditating on it every day and what it actually means and saying, how does this point me to Christ? We need to be, be students of the word. We need to be understanding how it applies to our life as a believer. What we don't need to be doing is looking for secret hidden messages within the passage of scripture that no one would ever come to if they also read the passage of scripture. Scripture points to Christ. And so we need to keep that in mind and remember that and always stay in the word in order for us to have our minds renewed, for us to continue to, to be sanctified, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we know how to please God and to glorify God in everything that we do. Scripture is sufficient and you don't need this book. But I'm going to share some of this stuff with you so you know what's in it. And so we're still in this chapter. He talks about the three floors of the temple, that it was a three-story complex of rooms and there was enough space for demons to take their time and finding a less active area in which they can function with little or no interference. Again, he's reading into the passage. It does not say that in scripture. He's claiming that he got this extra biblical revelation about the temple and that's what he's saying this means. He says, if something as holy as Noah's Ark had something unclean living in it, and yet the Ark was still able to fulfill its purpose, we have further evidence that Christians can have demons oppressing them. Once again, go back to what Noah's Ark is. It's a type and shadow of Christ, type and shadow of salvation, and study that out for yourselves. Listen, the devil exists, and he does have power. And I have heard some of these ministers say this in the deliverance ministry. Yes, the devil does have power. And we should not misunderstand that, that he doesn't have power and that we shouldn't think that he's stupid because he's not. Having said that, there is much made about demons in these ministries, much made and far less of Christ crucified, far less of the cross of Calvary. And in fact, there was something I was listening to today and yesterday, and I had to re-listen to it again because I, I thought, am I hearing this right? That one of these deliverance ministers said about, uh, about demons and the cross of Calvary. And I just thought, wow, why? I mean, yes, we need to acknowledge that, that the demonic has power, but we have not been given all power and authority. Christ has. That's in Matthew 28. It says he has, not us. That's all. <laughs> That's another topic for another time. But at any rate, the, the teachings that come out of this um, type of belief system, they are so confusing and damaging and they do not honor the word of God. They're worth talking about. And I'm sure there'll be many other podcasts that I'll do regarding this. So be it. If it's going to help someone, at least one person, to steer them back to the word of God and back to scripture and back ultimately to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then so be it. So be it. But there is true freedom in Christ and none of this mythology that we have to worry about demons dwelling in some of room 84 in our being and that we need to give the Holy Spirit permission to go into the rooms, to go into our body, soul and spirit. But where is the Holy Spirit if you have to put him, if you have to ask him to go into your body, soul or spirit? What what is the understanding of where the Holy Spirit is at that point? See, these are the types of things I think about when I hear these ministers now. These are the things that we need to be asking. And by what standard and chapter and verse, please, of why you're saying this, I thought the Holy Spirit indwelled me as a believer. I thought he was powerful enough to overcome the tyranny of Satan that I was once under because of what Christ did for me on the cross. And now the Holy Spirit has been given to me and sealed me for the day of redemption. He is the promise of my inheritance. It's just baffling to me now. And, and I understand I used to believe some of these things, not the stuff that Pagani is saying today, but I used to believe some of the things regarding deliverance. And I look back now and I think utter foolishness 
to think such things and now to have better understanding of these things according to scripture. Such peace and freedom comes because of the word of God, because of what Christ did and because of the power of the Holy Spirit to illuminate, not bring new revelation, to illuminate the word of God. Pagani talks about the winding staircase that was also built in the in the third area of the temple. And he says, not much is written about the stairs, so we must ask the Holy Spirit to show us the deeper meaning of the stairs. Stairways are like bridges that allow people and demons to go from one level to another. He then goes on to say this. What's also interesting is that winding stairs look a lot like DNA's double helix. Could it be that DNA within the human body forms bridges and connectors that allow demons to transfer down the bloodline from one generation to the next and from one floor to the next? And that leads me to a clip from the interview four years ago that I want to play for you. And Pagani said this about deliverance and where demons can lodge in the born again believer. Book of Ezra totally took on a whole new meaning for me. It literally, I was literally reading uh, these real stories and real events now from an Ezekiel perspective, because Ezekiel was shown the same temple, but in the spirit realm. So now I'm reading these same stories that I've, we've cherished and we've loved exegetically, and, and you know, and without taking it outside of its intended meaning, but now I'm looking at it from all these verses, human body. And, and then right there, and I said, whoa, then it, it is not just my view that a Christian can have a demon. I said, it is absolutely possible, without a shadow of a doubt, that a Christian can have a demon, because we see all of the uh, all of the stuff that's going on throughout all of the history of the first king, second kings, all through the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah, all the stuff that goes on in the temple. And then the Holy Spirit said, "Now look at," and the Holy Spirit would tell me, said, "Now you see this event here. Look at it. Look at that." in what's happening now in this person's life or in this situation or in the body of Christ and this and I totally saw it and that's when I had a, a, a paradigm shift like completely and that's when I was like okay Lord how do I take all of this um, and just package it into one book um, and it took us about since we last spoke in, in like about a year and a half to kind of at least compile it and here we are Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, Scripture takes on a whole different meaning when you understand the temple is the human body, period. Without a shadow of a doubt, everything is connected to it. But now what the Holy Spirit is also showing me is, um, is don't just focus on the rooms. These rooms have electrical wiring in there. There's also, you know, the bone stru the structure of the bone, the skeleton of a house. And I'm like, okay, God, slow down, because this is just way too much. But now I absolutely see it, that there is not just the rooms, and there is, you know, genetic stuff going on, the neurotransmitters, you know, the atoms, and all of that stuff, demons hiding in the atoms. And I go, okay, Lord, we can sit here and cast a demon out all you want out of a room, but if that demon is hiding in an atom, in a proton, in a neutron, you can sit there and say, come out in Jesus' name. If you don't target it as such, hidden in there, it will not leave. And therefore, you get people going, they get delivered, and then a month later, you see them on the news because they killed their whole family. Why? Because there was a demon also hiding in a DNA or in a gene or in a chromosome. And that hasn't been tackled by the church, at least yet. Um, I'm just barely scratching the surface on that. But it's all, it's all connected. It's all connected. What type of freedom do you have as a believer if you hold to this teaching? Where is the freedom that you have? I can't find it. Because then if you believe that this teaching comes along, not only in the rooms, which he also says that believing in the rooms that demons can house in the, in the 90 rooms, because there were three levels that were in the, in the temple that Solomon built in 1 Kings 6, it, it mentions this, there were 30 rooms on each level. And these rooms were used to house the treasures of the, the utensils and, and the priestly uh, things that they were used in the, in the sacrifices and the priestly services. But he says that the demons can go in there. Of course, the recess windows that he says that Solomon put in the temple, those were easy access for demons to come in, that people were so concerned, as he said in that clip at the very beginning, about guarding the door, which John 10 is actually talking about that Jesus is the door, which John 10 is talking about salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> but at any rate, 
you know, there's this focus on demons. And so each level, there were 30 rooms and they had different widths to them and such. And so he makes the claim that demons can lodge in these areas. And he also goes a step further. He says that's level one. Le uh, then beyond that is the teaching that uh, addressing the furniture in the room, the electrical wiring, etc., the arrangement of the furniture, because that can also be related to a demon. And he uses the example of finding a crib in one of the rooms of a 40 year old man and that there's immaturity there and that he speaks to the demon there that's causing this man to be immature and not to be like a 40 year old man and casting that demon out. But then he goes on in this interview to say, well, you know, now the Holy Spirit's showing me that you can have demons hiding in your chromosomes. You could have them hiding in protons and neutrons and in the atoms of your body. How in the world are you supposed to have freedom when you could always be thinking in the back of your mind, well, I'm dealing with this issue where I'm having, uh, I'm dealing with anger. I'm dealing with frustration in my life. Well, now you, you've you gone from these teachings of, well, you got to find a generational curse. You got to find, you know, which family member opened this up that it can, it traveled down your bloodline. And now you got to go into the rooms or you got to speak to the body parts that are causing you to do this, that demons could be hiding in your hands or they're hiding in your tongue or they're hiding in some parts of your body. And now you got to think, well, you know, I wonder if I have chromosomes that are housing demons or I wonder if I have uh, protons or cells or neutrons that are in within the cells that are housing demons. I wonder if some of the electrolytes in my body are housing de like this is not biblical and this is not freedom this this is legalism like this is charismatic legalism this makes bondage in people rather than taking responsibility first of all because of your fits of anger or your lust or your lying or your uh, whatever you're dealing with that that the bible calls sin calling it for what it is and saying no Scripture actually tells me to repent and confess to God and to change the direction of which I'm going and to have my, my understanding and my nature transformed. And the only one that can do that is God. He's the only one that can change our nature. He is the one that gives us a new heart. Ezekiel 36 talks about this, that he gives us a new heart, a, a heart of flesh for a heart of stone. He's the one that does the work in us. He's the one that transforms us and makes us new. This teaching, I, I cannot believe, <laughs> I cannot believe that there are people that will listen to this and they will think that this is truth. And it denies accountability of sin. It denies biblical discipleship and it creates mythology. It creates teaching that's never mentioned in scripture as far as this being doctrinally sound. And you, the reason why the church has not tackled this is because it's not in scripture. That's why. Because it's not biblical. Because people don't need something fresh. They need the word of God. And that's the problem. It's no different. The nature, of, the sinful nature of man has not changed from the Old Testament till now. It's no different. It's no different than the Israelites who complained and grumbled in the wilderness because of their sin that put them there and God provided for them and gave them manna from heaven. And they still complained. They wanted something different. And and we can see how we have a similar way about us. What we have been given is not sufficient. We want something more something new, something fresh. We want to know that God is personally involved in our lives. We want to know that, that we can get extra biblical revelation apart from scripture to know that we are special, that we do hear the voice of God. Well, we have been given the word of God for a reason, and you will be taught by apostles in the word of God in the New Testament. You don't need to be seeking someone today that's calling themselves an apostle to receive their revelation let alone revelation that is not going to stand up against the standard of scripture because it's not found in there. There were no demons in the temple in the Old Testament. These people were committing idolatry in, in the time of Ezekiel when they were going in in Ezekiel 8 and they were worshiping other gods and that they were doing all of these things and thinking that God couldn't see them. God saw them and he exposed it for what it was. And that was the reason why they were in exile, because of their sin and idolatry. And let us not forget that apart from Christ, our hearts are deceitful and wicked. 
We will conjure up and concoct anything that is rebellious against God. That's why we need a new nature. That's why we need Christ. I do not agree. I do not agree with this teaching of that demons could be in my DNA. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for me. I don't need to be concerned again as a born again believer. I believe that what Jesus Christ did on the cross was sufficient and it's complete. And I believe that God's word is truth. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is far greater than any demon. And I don't need to worry about demons attaching themselves to my bloodline, getting in my chromosomes, getting in some room I don't have and moving furniture around that's not there. I need to know what the word of God says in context. And I need to remember that it points back to Christ. Are you looking to make a podcast? Spotify has got a platform that lets you make one super easy, and then you can distribute it everywhere and even earn money. It's all in one place and it's for free. And it's the one that I use. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit all podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, which mine is very basic, you can start creating today. And from there, you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. And when you want to take conversations with the, your listeners to the next level, such as Q&A or offering a poll, this is the best way to get the conversation going. And with Spotify for podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's free and there's no catch with that. And ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I've really appreciated the options that they've offered. And I like the fact that I can engage with my listeners, find out what they're interested in, and even be encouraged by the content that they're receiving and the feedback. So I highly recommend that you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started today. Now, Pagani goes on in his book to talk about the complex of rooms, and he says about the Temple of Solomon with the three main compartments, it consisted of the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place, but there was also a complex of rooms built alongside the temple, and he says, we have already established that these rooms give demons such as legion ample space to function with little to no resistance. He has not proven that. And then at the end of this chapter, he says the best way to describe what happened to him was when he read this uh, verse in Ezekiel 41, 6 about these side rooms, that it was like the um, the account in uh, Acts 9 when Ananias laid hands on Saul of Tarsus and the scales fell from his eyes. He says it was as if scales fell from the eyes of his understanding and he discovered a hidden treasure in a field just like in the parable of Matthew 13. He says it was as if the dark areas of my understanding were now illuminated and I was being shown a secret that had been hidden in plain sight. Just as Solomon's temple had 90 rooms housed in the inner court, the human body, the temple of the Holy Spirit has 90 quote rooms in the realm of our soul that affect our thinking, personality and behavior. And he provides a chart about this, comparing the Temple of Solomon to the Temple of the Holy Spirit in here. He does make a point both in interviews and in this book to to state that demons do not reside in your character uh, like the Holy Spirit does, but that they reside in your personality. And I'm just reiterating that because he's going to make that distinction. Chapter three is called Understanding the Regulations and Procedures. And in here, he talks about Ezekiel 44, and he mentions about how that uh, the person with the most power over a building isn't necessarily the building owner, but the building inspector, um, because the inspector has the authority to approve or deny occupancy. And that this is what happened with God and Ezekiel is that God gave this authority to Ezekiel says that this book he wrote was designed to carry on the work of the prophet Ezekiel by showing those who desire deliverance or are called to help others receive their deliverance, how to inspect the temple. Uh, the question I would ask is, if this is is to carry on the work of Ezekiel, then how is this not authoritative? How is this extra biblical revelation not authoritative to where everybody needs to obey it, like scripture? And he goes on to talk about different areas, the procedures and such in chapter three. In chapter four, he uh, discusses identifying demonic entrances and exits and the importance of being specific and so he touches on some different body parts. So the first one he mentions is about the mouth and lips. He says on page 57, quote, through our words, we give demons legal access to our lives. Where is the verse for that? 
because I don't see that verse. He does reference uh, Proverbs 18.21 about death, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And in mentioning Proverbs 18.21, he says, If our confession is negative, full of worry, evil, unwholesome, etc., we will open wide the, d- the doors to demonic spirits that can only gain access if we give them permission. Words give demons power. Let me just make a quick observation as someone who was part of the Word of Faith teaching and also involved in the New Apostolic Reformation. This is Word of Faith teaching. Uh, not only is the uh, triune being teaching it's not exclusive to Word of Faith, but it is taught in Word of Faith. I believe that that is a way that they have adopted in order to explain how demons can in- inhabit Christians, is the, the tripart being. Because some people don't believe that we're tripart, they believe that we're um, two-part being. But this is Word of Faith teaching. So when you say that your words have power, now there's a new twist on it in his book saying that you give demons power. So whatever you say, if you give it, you have negative things to say, then you're inviting demons to come in. If you have positive things to say, but you if a positive things to say, then you won't invite demons in. He says demons hide in the mouth and lip area and are consistently at work to make sure the believer is speaking words that bring destruction, negativity, and despair. Now, if you can speak things into existence, who are you? That would make you God, wouldn't it? So I don't know if that's his intention or not, but when you read that, that's the conclusion you come to. If you can call things into existence and you can summon demons by your very words, then you have a lot of power and authority. And the word of faith teaching goes back to the power of your words. There's many other things that are far more problematic than that. But the word of faith teaching, it does... um, teach that there's power in your words. So you have to watch what you say. You can't go around saying your back is killing you because your back will kill you. I was taught that. This is an, it's just another spin on word of faith type teaching is my opinion on that. And you don't have to agree with me on that. I, I just see I, when I read that in this book, it immediately like it, it connected the dots with me of word of faith teaching. He touches on the eye, the eyes can have demons in them. The ears can have demons in them. Uh, this was the one that was really weird to me, uh, as, as if none of the other stuff was weird, but the nose, he says the nose can house demons. On page 65, he says this, quote, this text is the primary basis for seeing the nose as a gateway to for spirits to travel back and forth in the human temple. And he's referencing Genesis 2, 7, when the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. So he basically says from that particular passage in Genesis 2, 7, that that's how demons enter. Now, that's not a new teaching. That's actually an old teaching um, of spirits, uh, demonic spirits being a breath and they come in through inhaling and they're expelled through exhalation. That's not a new teaching. That's been around for a long time in these deliverance ministries. But he's going to say that th- that the nose is a gateway for spirits to travel back and forth in the human temple. And he says, in addition to nose rings, which signify bondage to the occult, witchcraft, antichrist, rebellion, anarchy, etc., signs and symptoms of demons hiding in the nose include persistent sinus problems that doctors can neither identify nor control, drug addiction, uncontrollable sneezing when under stress, feelings of insecurity about one's nose. Yeah. Okay. And he also provides some prayers that you can decree freedom. Um, into these specific body parts. I failed to mention that, excuse me. But each each body part he mentions, which he has prayers at the end that we will not cover, but he goes through all the different body parts that you can decree and declare prayers over in order to expel demons from your specific body parts. He goes on to talk about deliverance through breathing gateways and the mystery of a sneeze and that God gave him the most wonderful revelation about deliverance through the story of the Shulamite woman's son. And he, um, he, he continues on to say that mucus is the perfect vehicle for a demon to use to ride out of the body. If the mucus is swallowed or sniffed back into the nose, the demons will be able to remain. This is something I've learned from personal experience. All righty then. Um, he goes on to talk about other regions. He talks about private parts. Um, and and mentions about how those areas are where demons can indwell. He um, talks about the skin, that demons can inhabit the skin. And he references the story of Naaman. And he basically draws the conclusion that Naaman had a demon of leprosy. And, and he got delivered from that demon. The scripture never says that. It 
simply gave the instructions for Naaman to follow in order for him to be healed. And he says on page 72, in addition, when we sweat, our bodies are removing toxins through the skin. And this is also a way demons may come out. But you are not being delivered every time you sweat. But you can pray a prayer and decree to get that away from you. And he ends that chapter with cutting away the old. Now, I want to make I want to make one more um, observation before I continue to move on and finish up the areas in this book I wanted to touch on. Greg Locke has recently joined forces with these guys that consider themselves demon slayers. And there's a movie that came out last month that I've covered. It's talked and it's called Come Out in Jesus Name. It made a reappearance or a replay April 10th and 11th. That's already passed. At any rate, um, Greg Locke has a, a deliverance manual that's for free on his website. And he has said in interviews made statements in the past that Alexander Pagani's book was an, in, a big influence on him in understanding deliverance ministry. Well, when you look in his deliverance manual, you will note that he has this similar teaching of casting demons out of certain body parts, including genitals in other areas. So this teaching is, he's adopted this teaching. This He's not the only one now that's stating these things. But this, this again, is not taught in scripture. What people need to be hearing is, first of all, they need to be hearing the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, their need for the Savior, why they need the Savior, the wrath of God from what they need salvation from, and they need to understand and hear the gospel. A born-again believer needs to understand sanctification. They need to have proper biblical discipleship. They need to stay in the word, be in a solid biblical church, be around other fellow believers. And we need to understand what sin is. And in order for understand what sin is, we stay in the word of God. And that's where we find when we're sanctified that God is doing his work by his spirit to help us kill sin and to continue to be renewed and to continue to be perfected by his spirit and by his word. This is not leading to that. This is basically saying well, we don't believe there's a demon behind every corner, but there's a demon in every body part you have. Whenever you have these things, then you have demons. And I understand there, that there's going to be pushback and they're going to say, no, we don't believe that there, everything has a demon. Uh, I've told people that, you know, they have a sin problem. Well, fine. But most of the time when we hear you guys talk about this stuff, you're talking about demons. You, d I don't hear the gospel coming out. I don't hear the call for sanctification, understanding sanctification. I don't hear teachings on biblical discipleship. Perhaps they're out there. But what is stressed among these men is demons, 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 demons. You need deliverance. You have this problem. It's a demon. You have that problem. It's a demon. You have lust issues. Well, you've got demons in your genitals. You've got, you've got um, you have wear a nose ring. Oh, you've got a demon lurking in there. Oh, you don't like the way your nose looks. Oh, you have a demon in your nose. You need to have it cast out. This is nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Chapter five, recognizing other key demonic targets. Uh, Pagani talks about deeper deliverance, and he says he began to hear the Holy Spirit whisper in his ear that he needed to pay closer attention to parts of the body that are often overlooked. For example, he mentions the tongue about how demons can hide in the tongue. He talks about the bones, about how demons don't actually dwell in the bones, but in the marrow where a person's DNA is stored. And if you understand about bone marrow, which is where a lot of your cells in your body, red blood cells, white blood cells and such are made, then you'll know what he's talking about, about bone marrow. Well, he says that demons lodge in the bone marrow. He says that demons can lodge in your back. So if you have back pain or something like that, uh, based on Luke 13, about the, the woman that had the spirit of infirmity cast out where her back was uh, malformed or she was bent over and couldn't stand up, then you probably have a demon in your back if you have back pain. He call, uh, mentions, he teaches on the feet, toes, and thumbs having demons in them. He talks about the face um, having a demon in it. And so there's all these teachings that he goes through about these different body parts. And at the end of this chapter, he mentions 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. And he says, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. He says, sadly, due to irresponsibility, it is often the case that our hearts belong to Jesus, but our bodies have become a habitation for demonic contamination. God wants to inhabit every part of us, not just our hearts. He says in Ezekiel 36, 25, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. And he says, this is done through the ministry of deliverance. I disagree. 
in the area of what he means deliverance, I believe that Ezekiel 36 is talking about salvation, which is deliverance. In Ezekiel 36, a lot of people tie that to John 3 in that discussion about regeneration and the new birth, uh, because that's the chapter where it talks about that he will uh, give us a new heart uh, for a flesh for the heart of stone, that he will put his spirit within us. And, uh, and I've mentioned that earlier in this episode. So I don't agree with that. The, the deliverance he's talking about is is not the deliverance I would agree with as far as what is meant by that. Salvation is deliverance. Salvation through Jesus Christ by grace through faith is deliverance. Colossians 1.13, as I've talked about in many of these deliverance episodes, we have been delivered from the domain of darkness and into his kingdom where we have the forgiveness of sins. We are redeemed. We are redeemed. If we have to be concerned with demons getting into us as believers, what hope do we have? How are we any different than the world? Are they going to say that there's not demons in unbelievers? So there's just demons in Christians? Really? So that's that's the message. That's what we're, that's the message you're going to go with. That's what you're going to tell an unbeliever. Well, you know, you can get saved, but you're still going to have demons that need to be cast out. And you're probably going to have to have de- deliverance maintenance done in a, even as a believer. And you're going to have to do self-deliverance. And you're going to have to look and see if at a cellular level or maybe one of your body parts has demons as a believer. Really? Really? That That's the hope that we have? No. No, I don't think so. Okay, chapter six. I'm sorry, guys. Going deeper in deliverance. Going deeper in deliverance. He says, some methods of deliverance are outdated and ineffective as the kingdom of darkness has taken its work deeper inside the, quote, house. He, They do respect the, the men uh, from the 70s that uh, ministered and, and, and uh, plowed the way, if you will, for these deliverance ministries. But uh, Pagani is making the claim that the methods are becoming outdated and ineffective. My question would be, where do we see methods in the Bible as far beyond at the name of Jesus that demons were cast out? Is the name of Jesus not sufficient any longer? I'm just throwing this question out. I may not get an answer to it, but I'm just throwing that out. Uh, we don't see any specific methods. And my uh, another question I would ask is, why is scripture not sufficient? Why do we need their strategies? Why do we need their methods? The church has grown for 2,000 years without the need for these books, for extra biblical revelation. Now, I understand that we can be encouraged and that we can, um, that we can gain some understanding when we read other people's books that are pointing us back to scripture in the proper context or in a, an interpretation that is valid. This is not, <laughs> this is not pointing us back to that. Uh, he says we need the Holy Spirit to bring new insight and to spotlight areas the church has overlooked when conducting deliverance, that demons also hide in rooms in a person's soul. We need the Holy Spirit to bring new insight. Again, why is scripture not sufficient? This is Gnosticism. I used to do this type of stuff, looking for new revelation, looking for hidden meanings in passages of scripture, wanting to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit for myself so I could journal it down and then share it with others and talk about this supernatural experience that I had and say, oh, this passage of scripture, it actually says this. I know that you wouldn't see that just by looking at it on the surface, but deep down, this is what it actually means. The Holy Spirit told me that it's, it has this meaning. And then some other person that claims to be a prophet comes along and they say, oh, this passage of scripture, the same passage the Holy Spirit showed me this about it and personalizing it and saying all these these itching tickling ear things that you want to hear that are about you rather than saying how does this apply to you as a believer at, in the day-to-day life and how does this point to Christ can you see in the Old Testament how this typology is pointing to potentially pointing to Christ How does this show us um, what the New Testament reveals to us about the fruition of the gospel of Jesus Christ? How does this glorify God? Instead of having this me mentality of what can scripture do for me, how about we have a different approach of going, what does it say about God and how does this glorify God and point to Christ? Totally different understanding when we begin to look at it in that perspective of how does this glorify God and point to Christ? And how is this applied to my life in me glorifying Christ and being sanctified and understanding the gospel, understanding the commandments of God's word, rather than trying to see what's in it for me? 
What's in it for me? And, and how does this apply to me? And how does this make me special? Mm. The mere thought, he says on page 91, that there could be an area in my heart that I'm unaware of where demons function without resistance frightens me, he says, and it should frighten you too. Well, it does not frighten me because there's nothing hidden from the Holy Spirit. There's nothing hidden from God. And I, again, I don't worry and neither should you, dear Christian, if you are a true born again believer, you should not fear that a demon could enter you. This teaching is unfounded. I don't care how many times it's been on the number one for Amazon. I don't care. I don't care how many, how high it is on the rankings of Amazon. Uh, multiple times, I don't care. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is it bearing truth with scripture? Is it bearing truth with scripture? That's the ultimate question. So in this chapter, he is going to talk about Ezekiel 8 and how it relates to deliverance, which I've already mentioned about the hole in the wall and that he says that you need to see beyond sight. You need to start digging and walk inside the room, um, alluding to all the things that Ezekiel did. Chapter 7, key rooms to target for deliverance. This is where he talks about Ezekiel 42, and he um, expounds on the rooms related to the male gender, which is the male room, the husband room, the son room. And then he um, elaborates on the rooms related to the female gender, which would be equivalent to the female gender, of course, the, the wife room, the, the female room, and the, the daughter room. He also talks about the ethnicity room. In chapter 8, he, he um, discusses the four steps to purge the rooms. And on page 119, he says, In the book of Nehemiah, we find a foreshadowing of demons hiding in the rooms and a four-step strategy to evict them. And on page 122, he um, discusses the revelation of what was going on in Nehemiah 13, uh, verses 4 and 5. And he says that demons have been prohibited from dwelling inside the human temple by the courtroom of heaven. The only loophole is if they are given permission to enter. This access is called a foothold. And this is why the Apostle Paul warns us not to give a place, a room to the devil, Ephesians 4.27. Let me just say this here. Um, to give um, the devil a foothold or a place does not mean a geographical location. The definition of that word there is opportunity. It does not mean a location. Again, just please verify what I'm saying and test it against Scripture and see if what he's saying matches up with Scripture or not. Please test what I'm saying to make sure that it matches up with Scripture and the proper understanding. He says, once a person grants a demonic spirit access, it will enter as Tobiah did and begin removing the articles of the temple and replacing them with the accursed items. Now, he is going to go on in this book, and I'm going to leave it here with that, to uh, to discuss prayers that you can decree and declare over different body parts and to receive deliverance. And then, of course, he says, you know, after deliverance, then you want us to fill the person with the Holy Spirit. That seems counterintuitive, and it seems backwards to me, because it, if you have to fill a person with the Holy Spirit, then why are you doing deliverance on Christians if they already have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Do you not believe that the Holy Spirit is big enough to indwell all these alleged rooms um, to to uh, have power over the alleged furniture, the wiring, the circuits, the outlets, the DNA, the chromosomes, everything in the body to where uh, no demon can come in, but you believe that that the Holy Spirit would cohabit with a in inside the believer who is the temple of the Holy Spirit, there's no definitive scripture to back this up. None. And I, I've made this argument before, but when you see people that are, that are professing Christians that are claiming they have indwelling demons, they look possessed. They're acting possessed, doing all these manifestations that the scripture talks about during Christ's earthly ministry, where they were indwelt by demons. They were not indwelt by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come. So that argument can't even be made with what they're talking about. You don't see this in the life of a born-again believer. Not to mention the fact, as I've said before, and I'll probably say it a million times more, but Paul and the other apostles never taught this in the epistles. Why? If this was so important, why would they not teach it? And furthermore, to make the claim that this is needed then is that not a claim that scripture is insufficient and, and is lacking for its teaching on deliverance? I believe it is. And as we end our time together today, I wanted to share some things with you that may provide some insight. Regarding 1 Kings chapter 6, 
John Bunyan had this to say about the building of the temple and the levels. Bunyan said, as the temple was highest, so it enlarged itself still upward. As it ascended in height, so it still was wider and wider, even from the lowest chambers to the top. The temple, therefore, was round about above, some cubits wider than it was below. Indeed, it is the nature of grace to enlarge itself still upward and to make the heart widest for the things that are above. The temple, therefore, was narrowest downward to show that a little of earth or this world should serve the church of God. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. As far as the understanding of the temple is concerned, I looked in one of the resources that I have, and this resource is titled uh, Rose Book of Bible Charts, Maps, and Timelines. There is a picture in here of Solomon's temple, and it diagrams each part of the temple and what the parts served as. And what I really found interesting in this was the different areas that are mentioned as far as the bronze altar, the sacrifice, the brass pillars, the sea that's mentioned, the holy place, the golden lampstands and the table of showbread, the golden incense altar, the veil, the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, even the storerooms. And what I found is that they there were things mentioned here helping us to see how this is relevant now. For example, the bronze altar then was where the people were requir required to regularly sacrifice a perfect animal for their sins. The blood of the animal justified the people before God and restored their relationship with him. But now we know that Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. He led a sinless life and willingly died for our sins to make us right with God for all time. No more sacrifices are required. And they list the scriptures such as Hebrews 9.25, John 1.29, Revelation 13.8, Hebrews 10.10, and Romans 4.25. And even in, in the mentions of the golden lampstand and the table of showbread, we can see that Christ is the light of the world and he's the bread of life. And the Gospel of John talks about this, the golden incense altar. Now we, uh, we can see that this is, um, represents the prayers of God's people are a sweet incense to God. So there are different things that we can understand when we look at scripture in the types and shadows. What I also found interesting when I was looking through here too, I wanted to go to the page here that actually um, describes what's going on in the tabernacle, which the tabernacle was in the time of Moses. And we can even see the furniture here. I know Pagani talked about the furniture and we want to make a uh, again, it's not about demons, but we're going to make it all about demons in the deliverance ministry of that demons can move the furniture around that's that's allegedly in these rooms in your body. <sighs> At any rate, the tabernacle, uh, it was a pattern of worship. And this is just a thought to, to throw out there. It's not it's not divinely inspired. And as I was looking at this and reflecting on the meanings of these different things, it really helped to put things in perspective that God cares about everything. He wants everything devoted to him. This is not just about rooms or about furniture or anything like that. This is to show that God is in all the details and that he wants all of it. He, he wants everything devoted to him. We were made to be devoted and to glorify him. We're to love the Lord our God with, with every area of our being, with all of our body, with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And then we're to love our neighbor as ourself. Those were the two great commandments that Jesus gave in the new covenant, which, by the way, are a summation of the Ten Commandments when you look at them. But when we look at the tabernacle and the patterns of worship, again, we see this furniture, the, the bronze altar. We see the golden lampstand, the table of showbread, the bronze laver, which the, these are all familiar from what I just mentioned in Solomon's temple, the altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy seat. And we can see from here, there's a chart in here on page 95 of this book, and it has these distinctions between the Israelites communed with God through the tabernacle. In one column, they have the Israelites communed with God through the tabernacle. In the other column is Christians communed with God through Jesus. So I want to read these to you. Number one is the bronze altar for sacrifices. Well, we can see today for us as believers, this represents Christ's sacrifice. The bronze laver for washing today, cleansing through confession. The lampstand in the tabernacle. Now we are enlightened by the Holy Spirit. The table of showbread. We are fed by the living word. The altar of incense in the tabernacle. This today now it represents prayer, communication, and intercession. Through the veil into the most holy place. Today now means for us entering God's presence boldly through Christ. 
And lastly, the priest and the garments represents to us today service to God and others. So why is the tabernacle important today? It helps us to know, first of all, that we are God's dwelling place, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Second, God's holy presence is among us. Third, as believers, we are part of a priesthood. And we can see this in 1 Peter 2, 5 through 9, Revelation 5, 10, and Hebrews 4, 16. And the tabernacle shows a pattern of worship prescribed by God. We see this in Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. I wanted to share that with you because I think it's important that we point back to Christ. We don't ignore that demons exist, and we certainly don't act like Satan's omnipresent, by the way, because he's not. Again, that's another observation that I've made in this type of belief system that, once again, I used to hold to some of these teachings and some of these beliefs, but Satan is treated as omnipresent whether it's intentional or unintentional, but Satan is not omnipresent. So you can't say to every believer, Satan, I bind you, you need to come out. And these guys and gals think they have such power to send these demons into the abyss, which we don't see that again. And the, even the apostles of Christ didn't do that. They didn't command demons to go to the abyss. Judgment is reserved for God to do such things to these demonic entities. But if they are sending them to the abyss, then who keeps letting them out? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the first person to ask that, and I'm sure I won't be the last one to ask that. But at any rate, I mean, they keep sending them there and, and, and saying this. Well, if it's the same ones that you keep doing, then who keeps letting them out? Some thoughts that I had about this, about what Pagani said about demons entering the temple and that uh, in, in Solomon's time that, that demons could be in the temple because he means that to symbolically uh, as a believer that that could happen to us. I think something we need to take into consideration is this. Sacrifices outside and inside the temple had to be spotless, had to be perfect, which we know is type and shadow of Christ. He was the spotless lamb. He is the lamb that, that takes away the sins of the world. The sacrifices had to be perfect, and the priests had to wash before entering the temple or tabernacle. So Pagani means to say that demons could enter the temple, but these statutes that were put in place for a spotless sacrifice without blemish and that the priests had to wash and cleanse themselves before they could enter the temple or tabernacle must be obeyed, but yet demons could easily enter through recessed windows that Solomon built or these other things. Oh, I've already mentioned about the word of faith beliefs and teachings that were, um, that were mentioned that could be correlated with these things. And as I was thinking about some of the, the teachings here that about secrets to deliverance, um, I'm going to make this statement in saying that there are no secrets to deliverance. And to claim such is to say that scripture is insufficient and that God left the church deficient in freedom and understanding and instruction for deliverance. I'm reminded of many passages of scripture that both Old Testament and New Testament, I'm reminded of the epistles, Colossians, Ephesians, Galatians, where Paul is talking, for example, and he's reminding professing believers, born again believers in the church of their sinful ways, of their fleshly ways, works of the flesh that they committed. And he's calling them, for example, to put on the new self, to put on Christ as he does in Ephesians. He's reminding them of sinful patterns, not talking to unbelievers, but talking to believers and reminding them of the sinful ways that they had once walked in, that they were not called to walk in those ways, but they were to put on Christ and that they were to walk in the conduct to which it would glorify Christ. He never told them to be worried about demons indwelling them. He always pointed them to personal accountability and responsibility for sin. And to blame a demon for your sin is no different than what Adam and Eve did. And in fact, you're, you're demonstrating that sinful nature in and of itself that you're blaming someone else. You're blaming the demon. Eve blamed the, the serpent. Adam blamed his wife. It's sin. It's rebellion. It's disobedience to God. So that, that in itself shows that, that that nature from Adam is still there. In that very act, of saying, well, you know, it has to be a demon. You know, I'm not going to, it can't be because I have sinful nature because I'm a born again believer. It, it has to be um, because I have a demon. That in itself is, is verifying that, that sinful nature that's still there, that needs to be crucified, sanctified, progressive sanctification, biblical discipleship. But, a, but first and foremost, beginning back to the gospel, because my concern is that people are professing believers and they really aren't. 
and they're making these claims and they have no understanding and they're in in churches that are teaching these things and perpetuating them and they're not understanding that for, they may not even be saved they may not have even heard the, the true gospel and then they don't even understand sanctification they've never even heard these terms grasping what it means to be a true disciple of Christ to truly be sanctified to truly be changed day by day to be transformed to understand the the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives as a born again believer these teachings make little of scripture and its sufficiency and as I think about not only the New Testament I think about the Old Testament for example King David King David was not a perfect man he was a sinful man yes he was a man after God's own heart but he was a sinful man in need of salvation in need of redemption in need of correction for sin and we know that the prophet Nathan came to him when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then had um, her husband killed after he found out that Bathsheba was pregnant. He did everything he could in his power to hide the sin that he had committed. A man after God's own heart who was anointed as king by Samuel in the instruction of God. This man did these things. Did King David ask God to drive out the demon from his genitals, or did he take responsibility? Did Nathan the prophet tell David that he needed deliverance from his lust demon, or did he, did he correct him and rebuke him and point him back to repentance? Read Psalm 51 if you need a better understanding of that, because Psalm 51 has, it deals with the very issue of what David did and his sexual immorality and his sin against God. He admits and acknowledges his sin against God. He doesn't mention anything about demons in there, about how he needed demons cast out of him. He acknowledged his transgression against God and that he grieved over it and he wanted to be cleansed and be made whole. And he did not want the Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit of God, to leave him. Scripture will be used in these types of teaching to, to justify the teaching and a new revelation will be given rather than providing understanding of the illumination of the word of God by the spirit of God to see it pointing to Christ. And that's what should be taking place in the life of a believer. I, I don't need to ask the Holy Spirit to go into my spirit, soul or body. And if I do, then I have a gross misunderstanding of where his spirit already indwells me as a believer. I am told to obey the scripture to obey God's word and ultimately to obey God. And I can't obey him unless I know what his word says and wanting to glorify him. And these teachings do not glorify God. They are bringing perpetual bondage to people that they are searching for the answers to their sin when they need to hear the gospel and they need to be in biblically sound churches to be sanctified. It may not sound exciting and it may not have a lot of hype to it, a lot of fanfare, but guess what? As a born again believer, you don't need those things. You don't need to be entertained. You need to be discipled. And it's not about what you want. It's about what God instructs. And God instructs us to be set apart, to not be part of these things, to not be part of these conduct, but to every day continue to, to be sanctified by his word, to be set apart by his word. And we can only do that by abiding in his word. And listen, I know that there's going to be people that make the comment, as I've said before, well, you just believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Bible. I believe that the word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and you cannot separate God's word from him. And I acknowledge and believe that God's word is powerful and it's authoritative. Why don't you? And you don't need these extra biblical revelations from these people. You don't need them. And you may hear me say that a hundred times if you listen to my podcast, but I love you enough to tell you that you don't need them. You don't need this stuff. You need to go back to what scripture has to say, and you need to get in a biblically sound church that is going to provide solid biblical discipleship for you to understand what sin is, why it's a reproach to Christ, and how you overcome it by being sanctified. First of all, by being justified, but then as a born-again believer, being sanctified, what that really means. And you need to sit under a solid pastor who believes in guarding the flock against wolves and against false teaching and is going to shepherd you well and, and continue to lead you back to God. And back to the truth of his word. And with that, I'm going to end our time today. And I know it's been longer, but I appreciate your time listening to this today. And I hope that it continues to, to spurn you and to drive you back to the word of God. Because that is the foundation you and I both are to stand upon. 
If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope that you'll consider leaving a five-star review. And if you want to reach out to me, feel free to do so at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. Until next time, be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesubscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesubscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.